Good afternoon. I'm an oncologist. I look after patients with cancer. Seems all we hear about these days is cancer. Why is that? That's because 50% of you in this room are going to get it. If it isn't already, cancer will become an unavoidable part of your life or the life of someone you hold dear. But I'm not worried about you. You're going to be okay. Simply by happy happenstance, you're living in Ireland, so you'll probably survive your cancer. About how much did we spend on the Rio Olympics this year? A cool 12 billion. It's a lot of money. Let's think, what would be more expensive than an Olympics? How about running a space program? How much did NASA spend in 2015? Yep, 18 billion. No, that's not big enough. I'm looking for something bigger, bigger, bigger. How about Apple? You know them, they make iPhones, iPads. How much money did Apple make in the USA in 2015? Around about 93 billion. Add them all together and this is about what you get. What we spend on looking after patients with cancer in the world. $170 billion were spent last year caring for patients with cancer. And if this trend keeps up, we're going to spend more. By 2020, we'll be spending about $150 billion a year on caring for patients with cancer. And unfortunately, the vast majority of that money is being spent in the US. Ourselves in Western Europe are contributing quite a bit and Japan a little. But the vast majority of those resources are not going to where the vast majority of deaths are occurring. It's called the 580 paradox. Only 5% of the resources that are going into oncology are being spent on the, in the parts of the world where 80% of the patients are dying. Why does it cost so much? Where is all this money going? Well, the pharma companies will say, my sexy drug was really expensive to make, and that's true. On average, your newest oncology drugs take about 10 years to develop and about $2.6 billion to make. It's a lot of money. So perhaps they're justified in charging on average about $10,000 a month by the time these drugs come to market. So that's for one patient for a 30-day supply of a drug that might improve their survival by a few weeks or maybe a few months. That's $10,000 for that one month for that patient. Are we still having this conversation? I thought we had magic bullets. Haven't we cured cancer? This was the heading of Time magazine in 2001. And it describes a drug called imatinib or Gleevec, a really clever, clever drug. This targets a distinct genetic kink in just the cancer cells of chronic myelogenous leukemia or CML. And this and some drugs since truly do have the potential to transform prognosis for the disease. And the elusive magic bullet is beautiful because it targets just the cancer cells. And in so doing, the rest of your body, your healthy cells, aren't affected. So the magic bullet kills the cancer and leaves you unaffected without any side effects. But of course, magic bullets are really hard to make and few and far between. So while there are occasional fabulous successes, the prognosis for a patient with CML went from a five-year survival of about 31% to 89% almost overnight with the use of this wide, the widespread use of this drug. But the reality is, I'm afraid, a little bit more mundane. We're certainly making progress, but what we're seeing are incremental benefits, by all means meaningful differences and improvements in survival for our patients. So this is what the numbers look like in Ireland. So the five-year survival, taking everybody diagnosed with every different type of cancer, about 15 years ago, it was 45%. You had a 45% chance of being alive five years after you were diagnosed with cancer in Ireland. And in 15 years, we've nudged that number up to 60%. Again, very reasonable. And this is taking all the cancers put together. What about what's happening in the rest of the world? And overall, it's a resoundingly good success story. This is the five, under five mortality rate. The great news is we are controlling sanitation. We are supplying clean water. We have learned how to control and to cure infectious and diarrheal illnesses. So our babies aren't dying in childbirth. Our toddlers aren't dying from diarrheal illnesses. And people are surviving because they're getting treatment for malaria, for TB, for HIV. The under five mortality rate has almost halved just since 1990. And because of that, life expectancy is up. While there is an increase all over the world, including developing parts of the world like our own, 
the difference is of greatest magnitude in the likes of Africa. So the yellow bars on the bottom, you'll see that somebody born in 1960 in Africa had a life expectancy of just 40 years. But the great news is that the great granddaughter of that same person is likely to live to about 70. The bad news, if you live long enough, it turns out you'll get cancer. Cancer is a disease of the aging. If you've got clean water, you survived childbirth and you didn't die of TB, you're gonna live long enough to get cancer. <laughs> this shows the disparity of cancer care across the world and what it means. So it's not just the cancer you get, but it's how advanced it is and how incurable it is when you might get it, or the fact that you might not have access to a doctor, never mind an oncology drug. So the blue bars show the number of people getting cancer. And you can see that up in our part of the world, along with Australia, New Zealand, America, sure, plenty of us are getting cancer, but the red bar is the number of people dying from their cancer, and the red bar is far smaller than the blue bar for both females and males. But as you move down this pyramid, you'll see that if you come from South Central Asia or Western Africa, the red bar is almost as big as the blue bar. And that's because this is how breast cancer presents in our part of the world. Very often, we're detecting something that a patient can't feel. She's having a mammogram, and we're detecting an asymptomatic cancer at a stage we're able to cure. But this is how breast cancer presents in the rest of the world. On the left-hand side, there's a woman who has a breast completely replaced with tumor. And on the right-hand side, there's a lady that we are too late to help. Her breast is also replaced by cancer, shrunken and small. Her abdomen is swollen because she has liver failure from advanced liver metastases. Her cancer has spread and she now has terminal breast cancer. Not just how these cancers present, but which cancer you get depends on which part of the world you're living in. So this is not a situation that the one solution is going to work everywhere. HDI is a scoring system called the Human Development Index that's used to rank countries around the world. It takes into account life expectancy, education, and GDP of a country. Ourselves, the USA, we would be very high HDI countries, but lower income countries, as you can imagine, would be medium and low HDI. In our part of the world, we see a lot of lung, breast, prostate, colon cancer. But as you move into the medium and to the low HDI countries, suddenly you see cancers becoming top five killers, and they have an endemic viral cause so you'll see gastric cancer, liver cancer caused by hepatitis B and C, and cervical cancer, the biggest cancer killer of women in Asia and in China, caused by human papillomavirus, a preventable virus, a virus that is spread by sexual contact. Even education alone can impact the incidence of HBV. And these are the causes of cancer in lower HDI countries. Turns out the vast majority of cancers have a lifestyle or an environmental cause Think about it. We don't need the $10,000 a month sexy drug that improves the cure rate a little bit. What we need to do is prevent these cancers using public health measures that we already know about. They're not all cheap, but they can be applied. These are the top five behaviors we need to change. Stop smoking. Educate people. A lot of people don't even know that hepatitis B and C are sexually transmitted diseases, that they are bloodborne target the groups that need it most, the sex workers, health workers who are exposed to blood products, intravenous drug abusers, target them, educate them, give them the tools they need to avoid the cancer, to get vaccinations. There's great vaccinations available for both hepatitis B and also human papillomavirus, that killer of women, that cause of cervical cancer. We've chatted already today about how very difficult it is to change behaviors got to change approaches and cultures around alcohol. Yes, banning sports advertising for alcohol, reducing um, sugar in drinks for our children, increasing the tax on sugary drinks. It's not easy to do these things, but this is how you prevent cancer rather than coming in too late when you can't cure it. We can ill afford to cure these cancers. We've got to prevent them. Half of all the cancers we know about and we have today could be prevented by things we already know how to do. I can't but give an extra slide to smoking. The smoking ban worked. The smoking adult population in Ireland fell from about 30% to 20%. That's a success story. But very soberingly, 
the smoking rate amongst our youngest, poorest women, adults aged 18 to 30, living in urban Ireland, has crept up to more than 50%. This is when they're developing the habit. It's going to be very hard to stop them from smoking if they started at 18, 19, 20. So we've got a long distance still to come. Smoking is linked to more than 15 cancers and single-handedly contributes to the formation of over 90% of lung cancers in men and over 50% of lung cancers in women. And lung cancer has been the most common cancer in the world since 1985. This is a little slide about infectious causes of cancers. And what you can see here is that infections contribute to about 2 million cancers a year, and that spread is disproportionate depending on which part of the world we're living in. Again, we're fortunate where we live, infections contribute to a minority of cancers. But you'll see on the left the big bar looking at viruses like hepatitis B and C causing liver cancers, Helicobacter pylori, it's a little bug endemic in some areas that causes stomach cancer. It can be cured, completely cleared, eradicated with two weeks of cheap antibiotics. And how about human papillomavirus, a fantastic example of prevention at its best. The HSE has introduced the human papillomavirus vaccine for all girls in first year of secondary school in Ireland free of charge. There's a latency between the time you pick up the virus and the time you're going to be prone to developing a cancer of about 30 to 40 years. So these are estimates of the impact these programs will have. But if successful and if the HPV vaccination program is used correctly, it's estimated that the incidence of cervical cancer, that huge killer of women worldwide, will be reduced by half within about 40 years. There's no doubt prevention is better than cure, Next best is dete to detect it early. 90% of cancers can be cured if they're caught at stage one, the earliest stage in most instances when they can be removed by surgery. And actually these approaches, if you use them thoughtfully, if you target not everybody in every population, but at-risk groups, can be very inexpensive. So mammography works excellently well for the vast majority of breast cancers. We've got ways to screen for cervical cancer. If we haven't used the vaccine, we'll at least detect it early, do a pap smear, or even just inspection with acetic acid, a, a vinegar solution. You don't even need to be a doctor to look at a cervix and to highlight if there are areas that don't look like the other areas of a cervix. And then you've got to target your approaches. In parts of the world where oral cancers are endemic, look in their mouths, just open wide, see what you see and send them for help early, get them access to care. Colon cancer, a big killer, also can be detected quite easily by checking the stool. So I've mentioned a little bit about preventing the cancer, stopping it from occurring, and a little bit about detecting it early. What about treatment? How can we bring care and provide access to those in a resource poor setting? And that's what it really boils down to. We need to give a woman who happens to be born in Haiti the same chance, the same opportunity to get treatment to survive as her counterpart in Ireland. This is Evelyn. Evelyn is a patient we treated in Haiti with cheap, old chemotherapy drugs. And this is how well they worked. You can see the before and after picture. Evelyn represents both the successes and the limitations of our program in Haiti. She responded beautifully well to her treatments but she never came back to the clinic. I don't know what became of Evelyn or what befell Evelyn. We never saw her again. Partners in Health is a charity founded by a Dr. Paul Farmer, founded to bring and provide the benefits of modern medicine to people who need it most in the most rural and poorest parts of the world. It began in Haiti, has now spread to over 36 countries worldwide. I'd like to finish with the words of Paul Farmer who said that the idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that's wrong with this world. I hope I've shown you that there is, we are on the cusp of a global epidemic. Cancer is going to be an unavoidable problem. We're going to need to work together to come up with collaborative, flexible solutions to prevent, to detect, and to treat our brothers and sisters with cancers worldwide. But for now, I'll keep it pretty simple. Stop smoking, eat healthily, educate and vaccinate your children. Thank you.